Welcome to an all new episode of Women's World, the show where women's voices come alive. I'll be your host for today's program. I'm Sonia Bhattacharya. Well, the minute we say the term entrepreneurs, I believe the first word that comes to our mind is risk takers. And very rightly so, as to venture into any business, one needs vision, wisdom and audacity. So on this episode of Women's World, we will be conversing with three successful entrepreneurs of the Northeast who have dared to pursue their dreams. Firstly, I have with me Ms. John B. Pukon, Director of Jungle Travels India and Assam Bengal Navigation Company, both National Tourism Award winning travel companies. She's also the National Vice President of Fiki Flow. I'm also joined by Ms. Atrey Thekedat, an entrepreneur in the IT sector. Ms. Atri is the founder of Web.com India Private Limited, one of Assam's leading software development companies. And I'm also extremely delighted to be in the company of Dr. Nivedita Bhattakur Sondhi, a successful entrepreneur and a CEO of LB Group, and also founder of Akhilapath, an eco-friendly company which produces handmade paper products. So first of all, thank you so much, ladies, for joining me on the show. Such a privilege to be seated among three women who've dared to stand against the tide. I think that's how I'll introduce the three of you in the best possible way. So first of all, the first question I'd like to know, I think I'd like to know from Ms. Janbi and then mm -hmm. after that from the two of you as well. How did you make this decision of venturing into the path of entrepreneurship? Well, it was uh, something we'd always, you know, love to do and something you do for yourself and along the way you do for the people. It, uh, we weren't cut out for the regular nine to five job. And uh, what best than uh, tourism is what came to our mind. And uh, it's been a great journey. We didn't really think that we were becoming, striking out as an entrepreneur or anything. Those days, that was 30 years ago. Right. We just started, we had a dream, and we tried to put it into place, and we worked towards it. And today, of course, we acknowledge there's women entrepreneur and things, but it wasn't the way I started out. I started out really for the satisfaction of doing something and the challenge of doing something, and uh, the responsibility we felt about promoting our part of the world, okay. our region to the rest of the world. So that is the passion we started with. And what's very interesting is that you had a degree, I mean, journalism as well. So and how, how did tourism happen after that? Was it something you were always passionate about? Or you, you know, when you went outside, mm -hmm. you were also living abroad. Mm -hmm. So did you feel like people needed to know Northeastern India better? Well, you know, it's uh, interesting you ask because I was a trained journalist, but my husband and I, Ashish and I, when we got married, 81 and came back to Assam. There was no Doordarshan. So I, my job as a journalist was unfulfilled. And Ashish was the one who said, why don't you do something for yourself? Let's start promoting, you know, the jungles of Assam. Let's call it jungle travel. It was just a dream, you know. And Ashish is basically a tea man and I'm the journalist. So we put our heads together and, uh, okay, let us start and let's start promoting our area. So it all fell into place. And uh, we had nobody to learn from. There was no, I mean, there were uh, two operators earlier as well. But uh, I think the passion that we brought into this and the focus we wanted, now they call it ecotourism and green tourism. But uh, it was something we just did along the way. So it was a trial and error Trial method. and error, the trick is not to repeat the same mistakes. Right. And carry on and learn and uh, you know, enjoy what you're doing along the way and carry the people along. Along okay, the way. that's lovely, and I think destiny has a way of unfolding itself. Yes. And we've enjoyed every bit of it, every bit of the journey, and we are still learning, and every day you learn. That's amazing. I think that's the best thing to take away from that, that every day we're still every learning and learning. growing. And what about Dr. Nivedita? How did your journey begin? Well, my journey is very strange. I started off because I'm a trained doctor. Uh, I went to the UK um, 20 years back. Um, to do my fellowship that I did. But I had a dream too. Um, I'm a third ge generation entrepreneur. My grandfather started right. this journey with tea and uh, my father continued it. Um, and so I wanted to do something slightly out of the way than clinical medicine. So I went into the health policy area and I still work in that as a specialist. Um, so 20 years I worked and I uh, worked with uh, the big four management consulting, so right from McKinsey's to PricewaterhouseCoopers, and I learned a lot. And then finally in 2016, I thought, no, it's time to come back. Um, my mother had started this small CSR project with handmade recycled uh, products, 
and uh, I, you go around the world and you see lovely paper products being made and obviously there's this huge consciousness that's coming out of you know how uh, the conventional paper uh, destroys forests, trees, what can we do as alternatives. So we put our heads together and we've come up with Ekilapat. Um, it's, uh, it's been a wonderful journey, as Janaviva rightly said. Um, we're full of challenges, but each day we learn and we move on from there. Right. That's such a creative initiative that you've started. I think people talk about saving the environment, but very seldom do people actually do something about it. Yeah. So it's commendable that you've actually taken an action. You know, that's yeah. very, very nice. Thank and I you hope so you'll much. be inspiring many Thank people you. today, I'm sure. And uh, what about Ms. Atre? How did you decide that this is something that you would like to pursue? I actually, um, you know, I didn't start out to be an entrepreneur. I wanted to work in a multinational. Okay. So I'm an engineer. I'm a computer engineer. I have an MBA in information systems. Um, I started my um, journey at uh, Hewlett Packard in Singapore. I used okay. to work for Hewlett Packard uh, because that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to work for a multinational. But, uh, you know, I started the working and very soon I realized that it's not, not actually what I want to do, but I want to, you know, work for myself instead. So I'm like an entrepreneur by chance. So I quit my job and I came back to Assam. This was in the late 90s. And that's when I started Webcom. I knew I had to work for myself. So, and I was being young and, you know, reckless in a way right. helped because I had no responsibilities. And I didn't, the thought that I might uh, fail never crossed my mind. And that's how my husband Arun and I came back and we started Webcom. Um, so it's been a great journey. We've had, uh, you know, we've learned, like the vote mentioned, we've learned a lot along the way. And um, yeah, I mean, there's no regret coming back. And I'm you've so got glad a degree in MBA too. as well? I have a BTEC degree and I'm an MBA as MBA. well. MBA. And how helpful was the degree, I mean, to pursue entrepreneurship? Did it help or was it something you had to learn through the practical uh, means of Well, I mean, it? the practical aspect of it, no degree can teach you. Right. But I think the degrees give you a discipline and it gives you, you know, um, it gives you some sort of um, uh, professionalism, you know, you can bring into the work. So okay. it gives you, um, yeah, it sort of fine tunes your um, efforts a bit. No and I think what's fascinating here is that all three of you have had separate degrees. Mm -hmm. So we have journalism here, then you have an MBBS degree. Yeah, and MBBS as well as an MBA as well. As well as an MBA. Yeah. And then we've got an engineer. Engineer and, and, an and, MBA, and an MBA. But I'm working in the IT sector, which is my right. sector. So you did have the option of taking up something more comfortable, something mm -hmm. more cushy, you know, something easy. Yeah. And then you, yet you said, okay, no to that, yet yeah, no to a nine to five job. And you said, okay, I'm going to step into entrepreneurship. Okay. And definitely it's not an easy path. It's filled with hurdles, like I said in the introduction, full of Absolutely. risks. So if you can tell our viewers a little bit mm -hmm. about what the journey was like, what were some of the hurdles that you had to overcome? Well, first, uh, when we got into, we decided to start the Jungle Travels India. And our vision was that we'll bring in foreign tourists into Assam. But then we realized it's a very seasonal business. What do you do the rest of the six months? Then we looked around and we said, OK, uh, we find, to our absolute surprise, that there's nobody issuing international tickets in the entire Northeast. People went to Calcutta to get their international ticket. We said, we have to find out. It can't be some rocket science. And then we uh, became the first IATA, agent of the Northeast. For that, I had to get that American Express uh, services had come to Northeast looking for a partner. And through that connection only could we get that training in Mumbai and uh, you know get that ayata so it was just that i think the complacency in the region that nobody was doing it was fine calcutta was like our cultural and emotional capital of the northeast right. even now if you say people still have that okay beyond northeast they can't see beyond calcutta so that had to change i think that that uh, resolve we found that we have to do something about it very happy we could do that brought in and then we opened up the floodgates really of aviation into the northeast and all the others have come in so we take that as our you know uh, you happiness were in, you were a pioneer yes and the fact that uh, also you know we had that little uh, thing about standing up for your state because that time in calcutta it was like oh the northeast are so simple you go there with bags of money and you can do your ticket and there are no problems asked no questions asked that was the attitude people had towards the northeast right a simple innocent people who won't do so that we brought in that professionalism, I think. 
Then that was in, uh, to, uh, we started in, in 1989. We got our first IATA in 1996. Then in 2003, another thing happened along the way was we look at the magnificent river Brahmaputra sailing here and the fact that we had uh, cruising in the waters before, in Indi before India got independent. Right. And everything had gone to a standstill. But my husband always thought that why wasn't it possible for us to start that river cruising again? So that is the other thing we, we went forward. So I think the idea is that you have to look for something different in life. Maybe that's what makes an entrepreneur. Don't do what is already set. We're looking for that extra thing to do. So that was Ashish's uh, vision. We were lucky we got a joint venture coming in with British partners. Today we are the, of course, majority uh, holders in that. And the fact that a small Assamese company from the Northeast could do it, bring in cruising into the rest of India, long distance river cruising. Right. So those are the little things. We've been, uh, we've worked hard and we think, uh, and, but everywhere the underlying thing should also be for your people. Absolutely. You know, so I think that, that, that drives us. That's lovely. I mean, to know that it's not, it's never been easy for it's you as well. It's not just commercials. It's, right. no, it's never been just commercials. And uh, what about Miss Niveta? I'd also like to know how difficult was it for you? I think for me, the challenges were in two fronts because uh, one was that I never, I've never worked here. I went out as a student, uh, and 19 years, 20 years, and you don't really know about the world. And I came back and it was, I didn't have the networks. I didn't have even friends. Two of them are sitting either side of me, but uh, very few people I right. knew. Uh, so I had to seek out my own network and I'm still developing it. Um, and also I think um, my focus was manufacturing. So again, as uh, Janaviva rightly said, they're very uh, stereotypical ideas about the Northeast. And I think that goes uh, also um, along uh, with the idea of what industries they can be. It's only tea, if you look at, uh, right. or oil. Um, and uh, most people engage in trading. And mm. I always thought that why not manufacturing? So like we have started now making domestic uh, cables, so wire cables. Um, and people always uh, talk about failure and you know all the doomsday scenarios that yeah. they paint. Um, so I, I think focusing on manufacturing, just getting raw materials, where to source them, where the manpower is a huge issue here because all our talented young people, they choose to leave um, or they have to leave because of employment opportunities. And I think um, uh, those have been some sort of challenges that we've been working with day in, day out. And again, it's, I think we learn from our mistakes and we move on. Right. Um, and we try to keep up a cheerful and uh, confident face in front of the world and uh, sort of learn from where we are now and where we want to be. Okay, there's something very unique I've gotten from both of your stories, but I think I'll share that only after I listen to what Ms. Atri has to add about her journey and your difficulties, your obstacles that you had to overcome. Okay. Um, like I said, when I came back to India after I quit my job in Singapore, I wanted to do something, you know, we wanted to do something on our own. So we approached NetFee for a loan and we um, started a training company. We had a tie up with a Swiss training company in web technologies. So this was in the late 90s. Um, we started this training company, and then there was this dot-com bust. So initially, we had the students, and then the training facility just dried up. So okay. I'm just talking about the challenges. Mm. So initially, you know, so it dried up. So we were left with this loan to repay, and we had no, uh, you know, no students. So instead of, uh, you know, I think that was a situation where we really looked inwards and thought about it and said instead of being depressed let's you know turn it into an opportunity and we you know we we had these people who were trained in technologies and we started developing software and web application back then because we had the latest technology but we since we didn't have the students we used the same set of people to develop uh, you know applications so that's how we started you know in um, and uh, it's gone you know it's uh, gone from strength to strength and uh, being from the tech field, I've always sort of uh, limited myself to technology. We, All right. um, 10 years ago, we started a training vertical where we um, deliver training again in uh, engineering design software. So it's not available in the Northeast. Um, so we do high-end uh, design software for mechanical, chemical, um, electrical engineering students. 
Um, yeah, so, you know, it's uh, like they both said, it's um, entrepreneurship is not for the faint hearted. You right. go through many ups and downs, <laughs> yeah. but the uh, pleasure of, you know, doing it right and the pleasure you get from when your efforts um, show results, that is something, you know, I don't think anybody, anything can give you that sort of kick. In a way, and I think yeah. what I really like what you said is that you decided not to get depressed when things were not going the way you planned. And that's a deliberate choice you made. Yeah, I mean, you know, you can, it's, it's usually you, when something goes wrong, the easiest thing is to feel sorry for yourself mm -hmm. and, and you sulk. Know, and sulk and say, oh, why me? But then you can also say, yeah, why not? Let's, you know, turn this into something else, you know. So Turn I think that is something that the aspiring entrepreneurs who are watching our show right now need to learn. I mean, when they see your lives right now, they say, okay, they've, they've had it all good and it's been peachy, a bed of roses. Yeah. But now they're seeing that, okay, it was not always like that. Yeah. And I think it's also a lot about compromises. I have a 10-year-old son. Mm -hmm. My son lives abroad with my husband and I travel every month. Um, so I spend mm -hmm. 15 to 20 days here and 10 to 15 days with my family. Right. So that's a compromise. Um, and my growing son, of course he misses me, I miss being a mother to him, but that's a choice that I have chosen to make. And uh, so th there are lots of compromises and I'm sure uh, uh, Atre and Janaviva will also say the same. So it's, uh, it's I think, uh, you make your choices and then you live with them and, and not get, you know, disheartened every time some little thing goes wrong here, my son falls ill, I can't run to him, okay fine. I can't do anything about it, I can't keep a grumpy face <laughs> or cry or you know, make a scene about right, it. So right. those are the kind of things that one faces every day almost. You brought out a very important point there about your family and I think yeah. that would be where mm -hmm. my next question would be heading towards. I mean, when we say a working woman, that itself, you know, people look at it with big eyes. They're like, how is she going to manage the two? Mm -hmm. And when you talk about an entrepreneur, someone who's started something on her own, you're leading a team. And then yet, you know, in a country like India, we have these traditional gender expectations that people have that it's the mother who needs to be at home. Yes. I mean, you can't deny it. Unfortunately, it's still there. So how easy or difficult was it for you? First with Ms. Janmi, mm -hmm. I'd like to know. How easy or difficult was it to juggle your professional and your personal life? Well, it was, you know, in those days, I have to say those days, we talk about 80s. And uh, the main thing is you have to have supportive in-laws mm -hmm. and the supportive uh, parents. Right. And of course, a supportive husband uh, who had the, we shared a common passion so we are co-founders of whatever we've done. And though he was in tea as well, we very much did this together. And with that, with Jungle Travels, I always call my fourth child because my daughter was two years old when we started Jungle Travels. Okay. And then we've had three along the way and Jungle Travels. And uh, they've also, and it's very important to involve your children. So we sit across the dining table and discuss the day and the, the problems, and they've also seen. So I think all of them want to be entrepreneurs at the end of the day. So okay. they've seen the way, we've seen how Mama and Dad have struggled with this company and they, it's grown before their eyes. So they're all now contributing. So it's like a family thing and uh, yet it's very professionally run now. We have great people in place. And uh, the other things we've learned is that, you know, get a great team in place, respect your teammates, give them, don't micromanage, look after everybody. It's like the family. It's, the company has also grown like that. So we've grown that way. Children have grown along the way. And uh, I, I would say in the early days, it was an option. I had the option not to work. But it was those days, they would uh, question me that why she was not directly, but you know, you'd get the feelers that there was only, um, like I came back, there was no Doordarshan, right. so I was trained on that. There was only the clubs, of course. I had the option of just being a kitty party, you know, uh, and enjoying my life. But I chose not to do it. I chose to sit out in the sun those 20 years of, you know, when I miss my afternoon siesta, I think those are the awards. So those are the things you, my friends would say, oh, come and join us for a thing. Or they said, I can't, I have to work through. And I enjoyed that. That was my passion. So with those days, and you look at the societal pressure, there is no pressure. Now, well, the pressure is why are you staying at home? Right. Mm. So that is such a, you know, positive thing yeah. that I, I see. I think that's a new age parenting yes. tip right and, there. Mm. And I always tell you young people that you all are so lucky. And you all are balancing the things so well. And things are so much easier. Our days from the fax on the telephone and the fax on the telex machines and you know the no mobiles, no nothing and I think it, it was it was a lovely journey. But societal pressure, yeah, you have to have that confidence in you so that uh, you can also answer everyone confidently. And the main thing is I always told my children that you all must make sure that you all do well in your studies, your life because if you do badly, they'll only question the mother. Yeah, but if you do well. Your dad will get the credit. <laughs> the credit, <laughs> so yes. My kids always laugh true, about yeah. it. I remember that. 
I can give you, I may, I may not sit with you for your homework, but you're expected to be independent. Right, no yeah. project work have my husband and I done with them. And when I go to a one studied in Holy Child, one went to St. Mary's, mm -hmm. I would tell the teacher, this project work is by my daughter herself, not by us. So that should be a difference between a simple work and a one prepared by the parents, right. which that seemed to be the norm those mm -hmm. days. But I think they've learned along the way, they were resentful in the beginning that, oh, mama's not helping, all the other parents do, daddy's not helping, the other people are taking leave to do the project study. But they've learned. Finally, in life, you're on your own. Yeah. Mm. You have to get that battle done. Absolutely. No pretty uh, project with the A plus is going to help. Right. And school so that's feeding works. Very important. I mean, it never works, actually. It never works. I was amazed school why people works. did that. And I think they've learned, and now they appreciate it. Right. So, okay, so that, I think that's, that's something parents need to take that's as well. young parents that do not be helicopter parents. Yeah. No? Helicopter parents, I like Helicopter that. Helicopter parents. Yes, we do cannot not be that. that. Let them grow. They all have their own personality. Discuss with them. Don't baby them. Talk to them as adults, mm. young adults. Right. That's, that's the way that's we that's raise that's our That's very kids. important, actually. No? And also, I think, uh, for me as a woman, uh, and uh, having a son, uh, uh, it was very important that he respects women. Right. Mm. And I think um, he, I through my life, through what I've done, and my mother also worked. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think what we've tried to instill is that a woman is to be respected for herself, mm -hmm. um, not have those stereotypes of, you know, how you uh, talk to her, what you expect of her. And I hope he grows up doing that because, you know, with all the rising crime rates and all yeah. the mm. things that you see in the papers Absolutely. every day, um, I would like to have to uh, have him as a healthy kind of attitude towards women. Right, right. And I think that's very important. So um, on that note, I think we'll have to take a quick break, but we'll also like to know from Ms. Atri about how you juggle between your family and your work. But before we do that, viewers, it's time to slip into a quick break with lots of exciting conversations lined up for you on the other side of Women's World. So don't go anywhere. <laughs> Welcome back, viewers. You're still watching Women's World with me, Sonia, and I'm still in conversation with three amazing entrepreneurs. Been learning so much personally. It's been such an enriching conversation so far. And I think before taking the break, I had mentioned that we'll be getting to know a little from Miss Atri as well about how do you juggle between your personal and your professional life. Okay. Uh, my children, um, they're quite young. One is in class 12, one is in class 9. Um, well, uh, I'm not exactly a helicopter mom, but I am very involved <laughs> with my children. Right. And, uh, you know, um, I do tend to, you know, I mean, I'm like a friend. And um, I think um, children, I think the biggest role models your children can have are the parents. Absolutely. So I always tell my husband, I said, you know, whatever we teach them, it's you and I, they're going to learn from unconsciously. So that we have to, when we, you know, whatever we do, we have to keep that in mind because two little eyes, you know, two sets of eyes are constantly watching us. So that is important. And I think respect for women, which she said, is very important. Empathy. I think empathy is, you know, it cannot be taught, but they right. absorb it. You know, the way you behave with your staff, with your parents, with your, you know, people around you, they pick up on those unconsciously. You know, it's... Um, you know, sometimes when I'm upset or when I say something to my domestic help, my daughter imme immediately says, Mama, don't say that to her. She's worked so hard. You know, maybe she did it by mistake. So then I, you know, I'm like, okay, that's a nice thing to say, yeah. you know. So that's the little, little things, but I think um, it all builds, uh, you know, it all helps them develop a well-rounded personality. Right. And respect for women, uh, respect for your peers. And um, I think today's children, they're very uh, influenced by the peer group. Absolutely. That, mm. uh, you know, the bonding at home, the connect which you have with your children, the communication lines need to be, you know, open. So there, there's peer pressure to do a lot of things, but they need, you know, they also don't know if it's right or wrong or how to say no to your peer group. But if they have the communication lines open at home, they can always come back home and say, Mama, you know, this happened. Or whatever happens, you yeah. know. So that that con that connection needs to be kept open, and uh, like hers, you know, she started when the first child was two years old. I actually, uh, the day I inaugurated my office, I got my doctor's report saying I'm expecting, 
Okay. So, <laughs> you know, like right. her, so I have two children. Two babies. <laughs> two yes. babies. So, yes. I have my you know, two babies the together. They've yeah. grown along. And um, I think being a uh, working woman, we are very, though we are not home the full day, we're very conscious of the time we spend with them. Right. So, the few hours we spend, we ensure that we're giving 100%. Because we're guilty in a way that we've not been home the whole day. Right. So, we put in, I think, and they also appreciate the fact that, you know, she's home and, you know, and um, I read somewhere, I think it was a Harvard study which said that, um, I don't know, you know, work, children or working women are brighter because uh, women, uh, when so you're so. a we working so. woman, we hope so, we hope so, but you know, but still hoping. Because, <laughs> because when you're, you know, you interact with so many people, yeah. you have so many different experiences, so your horizons broaden mm. and right. that you can, you know, like I said, children unconsciously pick up on the parents mm. thing. Really so good. I think, in, you know. It helps in that way. And that's actually become a benefit. It's been a, it's, it's been I look a at it as a yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. positive, you know. The um, uh, stigma of working women 30 mm -hmm. years ago, things have changed Change. now. I think yes. that's for the better. Really for you know. the better. Women are independent. Mm -hmm. Children mm -hmm. watch their parents and they also imbibe those right. values. So you, you enjoy a better quality time with your children. Absolutely. And I think that's so important. Because and, uh, you know, we, um, right. we are like friends, mm -hmm. you know. Communication lines are open always. Let's hope the parents who are watching the show right now yeah. will take that mm -hmm. as well, that we need to be friends to you our have children. To be, yes. They have to mm -hmm. be able to tell you good things and bad things. Mm -hmm. I tell them, I said, I know you people are no angels. You, <laughs> do, you will do, you know, wrong things. But just, you know, you must tell us. You know, right. Make sure you tell us instead of me hearing from someone else. Mm. And keeping that communication open is so important mm. because I think the minute they start hiding things, that's no, when yeah, things are. That's, that's very sad. Right. That's the sad and part. there's and so much out there now in terms mm. of the internet, yeah. in terms there's of so much. the gadgets and yeah. right. uh, the influence that mm -hmm. they have. And uh, you don't want to overdo the, you know, the watchfulness bit, yeah. but also yeah. you're constantly stressed about it yeah. as well. So I think it's important that they feel comfortable showing you what they're watching on Absolutely. YouTube and what, yes. what, what they're doing. So like with my son, his, uh, during the week, I mean, he's much younger, but, mm -hmm. but during the week, his uh, uh, gadget time is strictly limited. So um, right. obviously I keep a watch on that, but mm -hmm. there are, uh, he frets a lot about that because obviously there's another friend who gets all the all the time, in all the time, all the time yeah. so one that's has to make him understand yeah. that, that so I think that's a constant pressure because you're not there to supervise all the time there has to be the level of trust as well right. yeah. mm -hmm. because both my husband and I travel quite a bit and we have a Kasi Kong okay. uh, who's, who's been a second mother right. to him uh, mm -hmm. but uh, we have, but we are the responsible ones, right? We are the parents at the Absolutely. end of the day. So we can't sort of just shrug that off. So yeah, I think it's a right. double whammy for us. I mean, keeping yeah. the office happy of and course. the home happy. The home happy. And it's possible. That's what I've seen it's from possible. the three of you. It's yeah. absolutely possible. End of the day, whatever said and done, we are still responsible for mm. the family. Yes. yes. You know, however, whatever you do outside yeah. doesn't matter. Yeah. When you co come home, you have to ensure that you're, you know, yeah. The dinner's on the table. running, dinner's yeah. on the table, kids have done the homework, so it's, you know, it's... You know, and like they say, the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. absolutely. So I think yeah, that's I think so. absolutely true. Mm -hmm. And I see the three of you, I think that's inspiring to see you can ha have a successful career and a, you know, well, a well-done home yes. where everything is going well, your children are brought mm -hmm. up the right way. Yes. So that's nice. Well, you know, when you were, you know, sharing about your journey, about how you started off, you said all three of you were actually abroad and you still, you know, keep traveling back and, mm -hmm. back and forth. You keep doing that even yeah. now. So you've done something very different. You were you were in Singapore, and you were also abroad for quite I some time. Studying, you were studying abroad, working. so you had the opportunity of staying there, enjoying the benefits of a very developed country, mm -hmm. and yet you said, "Okay, I'm going to come back and do something in the Northeast," which many people I've seen complain about. People complain about how we don't have facilities, but no one does anything. Mm -hmm. So what would you like to tell them using this platform that instead of complaining, instead of always sulking, like we said, why don't you do something? What would you like to tell the youngsters who are watching the show right now? I would say that uh, you must turn every disadvantage into an advantage. There's always an opportunity somewhere. But you have to have an open mind. You can't be spoon fed that this is the best way, this is the right way. This is the easy way. You have to find your own path. If you're willing to be, you know, uh, have a different drummer, listen to a different drummer and walk your own path, yeah. only then. Depends on your personality type. It's very important that uh, one goes out into the world, uh, you know, with that uh, positive optimism. Now, what are you really seeking? 
what are you seeking? That in our truth must be, I hope our education system now is being able to help. I hope the teachers are rearing them, the parents will also talk about it. Yeah. Ultimately, what are you looking for? But it's all around you. There are no excuses. Right. And whenever and I speak to youngsters, I think this is something they always say, people of my age especially, mm -hmm. there's no scope in the Northeast. They are, that's absolutely wrong. You can create your own scope. Yeah. You have to carve that's your own path. That is something I, I'd we like to take We do not especially. agree with that at all. And what about Dr. Nivedita? What would you like to tell them? Create your own opportunities? Absolutely, I think. And it's also, I think, a desire to do something different. And you have to have a little bit of madness in you. Mm -hmm. um, right. uh, yes, I, madness I think that's very ideas. important because I think mm -hmm. uh, that's the single thing, uh, single word I got when I said that, okay, I'm leaving um, to do something back home. And then mm -hmm. they said, oh, you're mad. And mm -hmm. I said, well, I am mad. Uh, and I still get that because I travel back and forth, mm -hmm. as you say. And I juggle two, two or three things very unrelated. So I work mm -hmm. in the health policy and I work in the business and several kinds of businesses, tea and manufacturing and all that. And um, I think, as Janaviva rightly said, you have to create your opportunities. You will feel disappointed. There will be a lot of people who will be the naysayers. So they yeah. will always pull you down. Uh, as I say, the crabs in us, uh, amongst us. Mm -hmm. um, but I think you just keep on going, and uh, and every day is a new day, and you just carry on. Right. So we've spoken a lot about motherhood as well, but now let's just come back to entrepreneurship. I think there are lots of entrepreneurs who are watching the show right now. So there are a few general questions that you know that's going on in their mind as well so we'll be answering a few of those but first of all you know as per the recent Niti Aayog report that was released it said that the amount of women entrepreneurs is actually rising so do you mm -hmm. agree with that is that the actual ground reality I should think so because um, I, I though I come from the tourism field I'm yeah. also in the handicrafts and handling yeah. with you know the uh, the retail stores we got into with cognac and I would say the self-help groups is a remarkable success story for example and the northeast states that they've all the women have got together they've made clusters they're working positive no woman is really sitting at home even a rural woman everyone is working they're producing they're weaving yeah they should be doing a lot more i uh, you know i i think there is a lot more to be done they're not as organized as you would like them to be but since if you take the 30 years back scenario now yes i would say they are more women maybe not in the organized workforce but in this uh, unorganized workforce it's the women who are working end of the day, 50% of the world population, and it's the women who are mm. continuing to work, especially in, in our country. Right. Yeah. In every field, you say. And tourism is the second largest employer in the world. Mm. So I should say that the women's, that I would uh, agree the with that. The report is actually yes. true. Yes. Would, would you like to add? Well, I don't see too many women in the tech sector. Mm. That's the, right. That's you a know, matter like of fact. Like she said, unorganized mm. sector, you probably yeah, unorganized have more. Sector. Yeah. Uh, very few women in this sector, in this region. Mm -hmm. In the tech sector. Mm -hmm. In this region, yes. I right. think I see two sides of it. Because mm -hmm. with Ekilapat, we uh, deal with a lot of the village women. Um, we train them up. So yeah. we, we form clusters. So from, because we use a lot of the weaves uh, of the Northeast. And we want to showcase it, that. So, so we have a lot of women clusters that we work with. And even in our factory, um, we've given uh, local village women training from Jaipur on paper making and paper products and we employ them. As a, as a principal, we employed, yeah. employ them. Uh, so we see a lot of involvement in that, but not in my other side, which is manufacturing, for example. Oh, right. It's still a very, um, I would say it's still a very non asme uh, dominated industry, mm -hmm. in fact. Um, I, I have to push my way through because I'm, very, I'm a woman, but I'm also an SME. So right. uh, mm -hmm. two things two that, things uh, that are not expected yeah. almost. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot more in the more sort of expected uh, uh, professions, uh, weaving and mm. fashion the, and oh, beauty, yeah. and, which is a good thing. Yeah. But I think uh, women just need to be a little more adventurous. I adventurous, think. they need to come out of the box. Yes. Yeah. Right? They do that, I think, very yeah. often. So for a very long time, you know, entrepreneurship was considered to be a male's domain. And I was just going through a few interviews of some of the leading entrepreneurs of the country. And I won't take names, but some of them actually said that because it's a male's domain, mm. sometimes we're compelled to behave like a man so that we're taken more seriously. Like, for example, aggression or being a little harsh, which, I mean, these are traits, of course, that I think both men and women possess. Mm -hmm. But very often people associate it with men. So have you ever had that kind of an experience where you felt like maybe because I'm a woman, I need to act a little more differently to be taken seriously? Did that ever happen? 
In my domain, um, yes, because you know, when I started out, yeah. no one would take me seriously. I think I was fresh mm -hmm. out of college and in tech, they're like, what does a woman know about tech? Right. So then I realized I must change the way I dress. So I started yeah. wearing traditional Indian wear to work. Mm -hmm. And um, finally, you know, then you keep at it and then people like, okay, she knows what she's talking about, you right. know, and that's when, you know, they start taking you seriously. Mm -hmm. But it's a perception thing. Mm -hmm. First, first perception is like, what does she know? You know? She's a girl, what does she know about it? Right. So that sort of thing. So it exists. It's At exists. least in of your course. field it does. It definitely yeah. does. What about you? Did you have um, that kind of an I think I was in the world of management consulting, and uh, which is very aggressive anyway. Um, so you develop those traits. I, in fact, have had to tone them down okay. uh, when I've come back. Uh, because I think, A, it's not expected of a woman. Uh, I don't mean screaming and shouting, but just being aggressive and being matter of fact about what mm -hmm. you want. And I think there's still that little bit of expectations from women, especially to be, you know, a little docile dainty, and little, yes. yeah, dainty and dress in a certain way and, and come out in a certain mm -hmm. way. And I have refused to do that. So um, I am who I am. And I think if, if a man can be taken for uh, however he behaves and whatever, I faced a lot of flack also that she's too aggressive, um, she shoots her right. mouth off and... Uh, uh, that's how I am, and I think um, it's just that you have to take it. <laughs> right, and you did not change the kind of person that you are. Um, I did a little bit in terms of the way I dress. Dress, okay. Mm -hmm. Of course, I mean, I can't expect to be dressing the way I did in London. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so uh, I'd be wearing business suits there, so I've changed a little bit, but no, um, in other terms, no. But has it actually helped the, the minute you change the way you dress? Did it create an I impact? I mean, it gives you the, you know, you look slightly older oh, yeah. maybe. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, you're fresh out of college, yeah. so, you know, you don't really know how to, you know, when you're, when it's an, your own business, you're an entrepreneur, initially I would go in my jeans, then I'm like, no, that's not happening, you know. I have to mm -hmm. dress, right. I have to look, the, you know, I have Art. to look a little senior, I have to look more dignified. So that's how you, you know. And then ultimately, it's your work, work. which speaks which for speaks. itself. Absolutely, mm. that takes. Yes. And what about Ms. Janvi? Did you also have that kind of an experience, or was it a little different? For no, you? for us also, because you know, in that in those days, nobody in the travel trade. There were hardly any women there. They were all men, and the whole idea was a very clerical level. So when we started our first uh, uh, shop uh, store, which is in Silpukuri, yeah, we made it you know full glass and air conditioned with sofas and it was a big thing for Guwahati. It was so funny because nobody had ever done that. Mm. It was only the, the clerical staff would come. It was a strictly peon culture and the, and the owner, the man. And here was a woman and speaking to the customers and uh, people would love and they would come in in the evenings and actually sit there. You know, we had ministers from other states who would come and join us in the evening, the bank officials. So we brought in that ambience and that thing. We wore corporate clothes and you would feel businesslike and you know your stuff. Because for international ticketing, yeah. we would, it was like a doctor's chambers because we would be issuing one by one with my team. So and I knew my stuff. So there was, and we learned from our mistakes. So I think they appreciate that, and also things like you know the old norms of oh that time the monopoly airline was Indian right. Airlines, and all that the thing about oh you had to go and give him his daily you know sort of look after him in the evening his drink and all that didn't happen with us. We brought in a different I think style and a sensibility. And we've always been that. And it was strange because with that air-conditioned facade and thing, we were told that, oh, people perceived you as a little different. We want a different niche. All of Honkus Korisile to come over inside. Okay. So I think we brought in that dignity and that style to this travel profession. And I'm proud to be able to say that. That it brought in professionalism. People appreciated that. And uh, then it cleaned up the act. Everyone now has a decent, uh, you know, decent... Mm. The showrooms and the decent good staff. So that was the beginning. So it was the done thing that time. Right. It wouldn't have been happening anywhere else. It was an ayata, you have people sitting there. We could do it. So it, we don't have to follow what the norm was. We right. had to create your own norm. Like I said, we've always created our own space and people came in. And so I think all three of you have done that to a great yeah, extent. Yes, there have been a few changes that. you've, you know, accommodated, but you've not changed the kind of person yeah. that you yeah. are. Yeah. Yeah. So We've that is something that style. people need to take. To that be an entrepreneur, you cannot mm. change. You cannot right. change. You have to right. have that passion. Yeah. And, and I love what you said, you need to be mad. Yeah. You need to be mad to do something Absolutely. amazing, something out of the box. You need to be mad and you need to stand your ground. Absolutely. Mm. I deal with logistics. Mm. I, mean, you, I mean, you can imagine the yeah, and the picture that draws up when you talk about logistics, like truck drivers and you know yeah. big trucks and all, that's what I deal with and warehouses and all. 
um, because that's one of my main core businesses. Right. And actually, I've had people think that I'm the receptionist or mm. the PA. Get the coffee sort of thing. Yeah, right. because it's I'm sitting right, there yeah. and I'm like, where, where, where's your boss? Mm. And I'm like, I'm the boss. Mm. <laughs> and yes. it's like, oh, um, is it because your father's retired? I'm like, no, my father's not retired. He's in another profession right mm. now. So I'm here. Please tell me your problems. Mm. Right. And But there's some people who've walked away, some people who's really admired mm. it. Uh, and some people have said it's refreshing uh, because I think we, as Janaviva said, you sort of change the dynamics of it Absolutely. because you've learned from how yeah. uh, things yeah. are yeah. abroad or wherever and you change some of the things, right. maybe at the margins, but you try to bring in changes and I think that it has. So I think what we can take away from this is that like every profession, there are gender biases in the field of entrepreneurship as well, but it's never too late for change. Well, on that note, viewers, it's time to take yet another quick break, but more coming up on the other side of Women's World. Stay with us. Welcome back viewers, you're still watching Women's World and without further ado, let's quickly get back to this very interesting conversation that we've been having. So before taking the break, I think it became quite evident that there are quite a few gender biases that exist in this field. So on a lighter note, I'd like to know, what was the most sexist remark that was ever passed at you? Now when you look back, you find it really funny. Was there something that was ever passed at like that? Did you, was there anything that you can I recall? I recall now, too long ago. Too long ago? Too <laughs> yeah. long ago? Yeah, I don't think so. No, no, no. So that it was long time ago. Long that time ago. Long when time we ago. When we were I think young. it's also it happened. Yeah, I don't think it has don't happened think it really so happened. obviously. Right. Though. It's it's very subtle. Subtle. The whole yeah, kind probably of, you know, not so. Yeah. In so many words. It. Yeah. Just ignored it. Yeah, so I think, I think ignorance part. is bliss when you when it comes yeah. to this. Yeah. Yeah. When when something doesn't carry weightage, it's pointless to pay yeah, heed to it. Absolutely. I think that is something we need to take note of. All right, uh, you know, talking about a country like India, where it, it is quite difficult, or not difficult, but I think very few women have property ownership rights. So, I mean, we, we still have men who inherit property that still happens very frequently. So, has that made it a little difficult for women entrepreneurs in general to start a business? Has that made it difficult considering the fact that maybe they have to, you know, get some sort of help, aid from their fathers or their husbands, which again makes them dependent on the male in their lives? Not, not your personal experience mm -hmm. per yeah. se, but just in general. Do you think that happens? Well, that is a fact that uh, the banking system still requires that. Right. Uh, unless you have that entirely in your own name, you would have to get it from your father or from your husband. But I think the, there have been talk about changing that and uh, they were giving this um, one crore, a hundred crore, um, ten crores loan without uh, one crore, without one, one, one crore, crore, right? One crore. Without, uh, without any collateral. Mm. Yeah, collateral. It's there on paper. Yeah, but right. it does not But work. we are not work. sure if it I don't think working. it works. So. Yes. You, you don't think it works if it no, works? No, as in like I think mm. it, it, a, a lot of these policies I think are announced with good intentions mm. but implementation is not happening. Not it, happening. It hasn't happened no, actually mm. I think, I can, right. I can say for a fact. So do you think it's difficult for a woman entrepreneur to get investors? Is it difficult? Very, very difficult. Very difficult, yeah. yeah. Very difficult and yeah. uh, any aid from the government that's helping? We, don't, we haven't taken any. We haven't taken, we so haven't we're not taken aware. <laughs> I think there are some good policies. Um, so the 20% uh, preferences that has been given to MSMEs. Mm -hmm. But again, as I said, it's all in papers only. Mm -hmm. I I don't think there's even one contract that has gone out. And I, since I'm in manufacturing, and I can speak for it, where there's been that privilege that has been granted to local MSMEs, and I'm not talking about women entrepreneurs only, but local entrepreneurs who actually manufacture things here. So I think that's a small example of mm -hmm. where um, I think uh, many of the policies I are announced with good intentions, like the one crore loan she mentioned, but you go to a bank and the first thing they'll ask for you is the collateral. Right. Um, there may be one odd exceptions here and there, but as a generic mm -hmm. rule, I don't think uh, anyone is monitoring exactly what's happening on the ground. And that's a sad fact of India, I think, in general, uh, that policies are announced with so much of intention, so much of uh, expectations right. and uh, the last mile delivery sort of skips. 
I think that's unfortunately the case with most of the laws yeah. that we have. There are a lot mm -hmm. of uh, privileges, a lot of facilities that are available on paper. Yeah. paper. But, then but the public works. procurement policy for the central public sector undertakings is, uh, you know, it's implemented. Yeah, but All the right. state, state, state government has state just is, announced state it. State is in the draft. Yeah. 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 No, no, I think they've announced so it they've already. Announced yeah. it. Okay, but so let's happening. say there is a, a woman who's watching the show right now and yeah. she wants to become an entrepreneur. How should she go about it? Well, the first thing is she has to spend a bit of her own money. Most of the people go with, go for all these, you know, motivational talks and these bank, uh, you know, uh, melas that we have where we are interfacing. I'm from yeah. the women's wing of FIKI, and we uh, we get a lot of the banking systems and the women together. But you must also, you know, put in your own money. You have to invest a bit and then expect that loan. But people mustn't think that first you get that loan and then you will start. It mm. won't happen that and way. And you need a watertight project yeah. plan. Mm. A lot of times you what happens... You have to put in that... Uh, you know, that your sweat. project plan is not... Mm. Mm. Banks refuse. Why? Because you don't have a watertight project plan. Right. And I think in a way our banking system is very good. I mean, it's tough to get a loan, mm. but it's watertight. Well, yeah. mm -hmm. You know, they make... You, we make sure that you are, you know, you've gone through each and every step, and how the revenue is going to come in, how you're going to break even. I think that is that uh, discipline is required when you start a business. You know, it helps you think through scenarios which you otherwise wouldn't think uh, think through. Right. So yeah. that is important, though it's tough. I mean, like mm -hmm. she said, you have to spend a little you bit of your own to. money to you get started. To. But your, if you have a watertight project report, I think the banks will. So these be are two things that are really important. A little I, bit. Of I would investment. actually disagree a little bit. Sorry about the money yeah. thing, because yeah. I think many people will get uh, slightly. Um, uh, disheartened. They, yeah, they, they, would, they won't know where to get the money from. Yeah. I mean, yeah. many of right. the entrepreneurs. I think there are now sources where you can get money. There are websites. I can't remember. Yeah, like Netfee has, has yeah, yeah. a fund yeah. for the micro yeah. credit. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So Not there is. But the idea has market. to be there, yeah. and the courage has to be there to take that first mm -hmm. step. Yeah, that true. yes, you're willing to give away mm -hmm. your cushy nine to five job, or you might no. have to go. I mean. A year, maybe five years, even without you know that mm. holiday that See, you had planned, yes. and, and that uh, you know that, that uh, uh, some some I don't know some luxury that you wanted, or even yeah. some simple things like for the house. Yeah. But you're going to invest everything you have, your time, effort, money in that this project. I think that that ha that will has to be there. I and think. plus, that it may not work out. Yeah, mm -hmm. right. Know, it may not we, work out. We also out, need to be so prepared, prepared for the prepared worst. For yeah. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Of okay. course, uh, you know, there's like Lokimi Gawalia Bank mm. started by the Lokimi Bora yeah. of your heart. Yes. She's done a lot for women. Mm. So there are small stories like that, the, the mm. microcredit field. Mm. There are opportunities for funding. Okay. There are. But it's still the a Russia little difficult. It's, it's difficult. Yes. But you have to go with a clear plan. Mm. Right. Yeah. We have to toughen ourselves up. And uh, yeah. yeah. be clear oh. about what you yeah. want. And what women you want. by and large know that uh, once they've taken the loan, they've been very good at paying back. Paying mm. back. They're good. Yeah. Women are very good at very that. Very good, yeah. They like the managers at home. Once they get that loan, they will pay Study back. Shows. But yes, our job is to be able to connect them, what we try to do in Fiki Flow, connect them. And there are a lot of mentorship going on now, mm. Indian Institute of Entrepreneurship. They try to do a lot of work. So those are the avenues women should go forward and seek help with. Right. Mm -hmm. Even there are opportunities about mentors, and mentorship going on. You just, you just spoke about mentors. Yes. I mean, I, I have been speaking to a few, you know, budding entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. and they've said they've actually faced this, they, you know, they feel like there are less mentors available, especially in this part of the region. When it comes to women entrepreneurs, they're fewer in number. So do you think this does actually exist or is it changing? I don't think that, don't why would put a bi gender bias on it? Right. The entrepreneurs are not entrepreneurs. Yeah. Let's not yeah. get that, you know. Right. Let's Maybe not the make a bridging subsect. platforms are not there. Mm. Maybe the bridges are not there. Yeah. But mm. I wouldn't say there are no mentors. Yeah. Maybe they just haven't got a way, you know, to connect, connect to them. Connect yeah, to there them. are plenty right. of that. BYST. They did yeah. a lot of work with CII. Mm. In fact, I, uh, you know, every year I hold a mentoring walk. Mm -hmm. I bring in mm -hmm. uh, successful women, uh, you know, not only entrepreneurs, but from every field right. and young women and we connect the two. So these young women get mentored, you mm -hmm. know, whatever field, law, media, um, education, entrepreneurship. So they have a connect and it's up to them to, you know, keep up that relationship. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. because a lot of times women don't know who to go to. Mm -hmm. I want to take up a career in media, but I don't know who mm -hmm. to ask. So mm -hmm. if I get in a 
you know, a established media right. personality, mm. it's right. easy, you know, you can mm. get your doubts cleared or you can, mm. you know, whatever mm. uh, you right. want to ask. I think there so are also those sort of black platforms. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. And also, more than, mm. also there are some informal networks. And if yeah. you're a little proactive about yeah. it, I yeah. think you can seek out those. Mm. So I'm on the board of governors of IIM Kashipur. And there are a lot of, uh, strangely enough, so far away in mm. uh, Uttarakhand, there are a lot of uh, women, uh, g young girls from the Northeast there, mm. especially from mm -hmm. Guwahati, and I met them at the convocation the other day, and I said, why don't you come back? We'll get you introduced to lots of young women or, or uh, people like us who, who are coming back and doing some work, rather than going to Mumbai or mm -hmm. Delhi well, or wherever. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah, exactly. And you can, so they, there has to be that willingness and the eagerness mm. also to reach out, right, I think. Right. So it works so why both do you think ways. people are not wanting to come back? I have no well, idea. I love younger. being in the Northeast. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I wouldn't yeah. trade this for anything in the world. I always, you know, she's my sister and I would always <laughs> say, <laughs> you give me any place in the world, I would love to travel. I love to travel. Mm. I go on holidays, but two weeks is all I can take. Then I want to be back home yeah. in Assam. Right. Yeah. Let's hope that a few people change their minds after watching the show as well. Like you said, all mm. the good ones leave. But I think that needs to change this that brain drain that's yeah. been yeah. happening. Yeah. Yeah. That needs yeah. to pleasure, like working sure, in your own place for your own back people. Right. Right. Yeah. right. Because we have a lot of potential. Yeah. Absolutely. And now with social media and all the opportunities, you all have no excuse. <laughs> Very you know? true. Absolutely. We have no up the excuse. phone and check. <laughs> Everything's up there online. Right. You can yeah. even learn to be an entrepreneur online. Yeah. <laughs> online, yes. yes. Everything is available online. You yes. just need to know how to Take use it. Take a course, Sarah, right. course. Right. Yeah. So, so uh, Mr. Vedata, I remember you said something very uh, upsetting actually just a few moments ago when you said that someone had actually called you a receptionist. They asked you if you were a yeah. receptionist mm. once. Yeah. Yeah. And that really somehow caught my attention, mm. which, which almost goes to imply that somehow when we say leadership, mm. we associate it mm -hmm. with being a mm -hmm. man. Mm -hmm. And now that you are founders of your own you know, enterprises, mm. you obviously have employees who are men as yeah, well. Yeah. So, you know, being a, a lady leader, mm -hmm. okay, how easy or difficult is it, you know, to, to guide a team comprising of men? Is it easy, difficult, or is it the same? Um, as I said, I think um, I've had a little tough time here because I've always um, worked abroad, as I said, yeah. and I think, I'm not saying that everything's hunky-dory uh, outside of India, but here I think there are some stereotypes and uh, of how you are expected to behave, how you're expected to deal with a problem or solution. Over. And people get hurt very easily here. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. you're, if you give constructive criticism or upfront criticism or feedback, uh, it's not always they the on, yeah, mm. it's, they take it hard. So I think I've had to relearn a little bit of things or tweak a little bit of it. But I don't distinguish between men and women. And right. I, I employ around 400, 500 people uh, in Guwahati and uh, another five, 600 in tea gardens. Right. I don't distinguish. And I think after a while, uh, they come to accept you. I wouldn't say that it's been a particularly tough journey. Um, but I think it's, there's also this age difference that uh, mm. I have slightly older people who've perhaps worked with my father and now here's the chit of a girl coming and yeah. kind of, you know, yeah. taking over and all. So there, there's this tiny little hiccups on the way, but nothing major. So and far. eventually they accept you the way yeah, you are. Yeah, they accept. And this actually came from someone from outside, uh, someone okay. from uh, Mumbai. Who, who thought I was a receptionist, and that was in the early days when I was in my, you know, like she said, in my shirt and my right. uh, whatever jeans or something, and um, and he thought, well, I was, and I'm like, sorry, but but so he, the, it was I all think right. The story is worse. Uh, Outside the northeast. Yeah, outside yeah. the northeast. Okay. Not so we yeah. can't deny that there are these stereotypical notions that people have, but slowly but surely mm -hmm. things are changing, yeah. and we can be a part of that change. Yeah. Of so I mean, I, I, it was so inspiring to just sit with the three of you. You're trendsetters in your own right. You're pioneers, and we hope we've been able to inspire so many young women who are watching the show today. So once again, I'd like to thank you so much for taking out your valuable time and joining me on Women's World. Mm -hmm. uh, it was such a delight conversing with you. So viewers, if it's you a, are a budding mm -hmm. entrepreneur, you're someone who wants to take up this profession remember like we've just heard it requires courage it requires sacrifice and there will be hurdles along the way but nothing is impossible i hope you take that to heart and we'll see many more successful entrepreneurs from the region in the days to come well on that note it's time for me to sign off but stay tuned to northeast live for more news and latest updates we'll be back with a fresh episode of women's world next tuesday at 8 p.m thanks for joining us